It's time for the spooky edition of Games of Decades Past. Even though I'm not going to talk about a single horror game, but you know, let's just roll the intro. So I decided to do something a little bit unorthodox this time around for Games of Decades Past. Since this is October, it's one of the busiest months of the year, and there's a lot of games to talk about. And while I cannot talk about absolutely everything that came out in October 2003, I decided instead of just talking about a single game, I'll actually talk about three different releases, and then at the very end I'll just give a quick rapid fire on some of the more notable releases that I've missed. So let's start with probably one of the most notable games on the original Xbox that... Shockingly enough, has not come back since its original inception, and that is none other than Crimson Skies High Road to Revenge. What's really fascinating to me about Crimson Skies High Road to Revenge is that it's a sequel. For the longest time, I thought this was the only game in the franchise, but turns out just three years prior in the year 2000, there was an original Crimson Skies that was developed by Zipper Interactive. They would later on end up making the SOCOM franchise for the PlayStation 2, which is kind of funny when you think about it. In Crimson Sky, you play the role of Nathan Dr I mean, Nathan Zachary. Na Nathan Zachary, because... Yeah, I mean, they're definitely similar, even though this game preceded Uncharted by four years, but uh, you can clearly see the Uncharted vibes, and I think that's actually what really works in favor for this game. The story of Crimson Skies plays a lot of, like, those classic B-movies, kind of like Indiana Jones in a way, where you're playing as this dashing hero who flies planes and does daring feats in the sky and defeating evil... Uh, Sky Pirates, it's very exciting and entertaining. I'm not gonna tell you it's, you know, one of the best stories told in video games, but it serves the the atmosphere of the game very well, especially with the sweeping soundtrack that does sound something like John Williams would have scored with the orchestra and the crescendo when things get exciting on screen. It's very, very intense and very appropriate too. And I love the idea, it also takes place in a fictional 1930s, so while everyone uses traditional planes, per se, uh, you get to fight some crazy machines that probably wouldn't exist during that time, like this egg thing with mechanical legs, or this caterpillar that can shoot lasers from its mouth. It's, it, it gave me like a weird Wild Wild West vibe, which is probably the only time I'm going to reference that movie in a video in my life. I never owned an original Xbox back in the day, so when I got my 360, I actually had a few original Xbox games that thankfully were backwards compatible, and Crimson Skies was the very first game I beat as a backwards compatible Xbox game, which was pretty exciting to me. And I had a blast playing this. In fact, this game, even though it wasn't like, you know, a huge commercial success, I think it has like a really big cult following to the point that not only that it was backwards compatible with the Xbox 360, but later on it would be backwards compatible with the Xbox One games, and obviously through that, through the Xbox Series X, which in theory means is that while I did talk about the single player, which is pretty good, I mean, it's a nice five to seven hour adventure, which nowadays is perfectly serviceable to me. What's cool about the multiplayer is that even though the online services are down now, you can actually play this by a system link, and theoretically, you can connect an original Xbox, and an Xbox 360, an Xbox One, and an Xbox Series console together to play this one game in multiplayer, which is insane, and the best part, that it works incredibly well. It's very fun. Crimson Sky is excellent, but for some reason, this was the very last game in the franchise. 20 years later, there has been nothing else, and it's crazy to me since Microsoft made the fantastic Microsoft Flight Simulator, so you would think that it maybe Crimson Skies deserves another chance, and if that ever happens, I'll be the first in line, so if you ever get a chance to play Crimson Skies, I highly recommend it.
since it's getting pretty chilly right now in the winter, it's time for me to talk about the next game, SSX 3. You're tuned to Radio Big. I'm DJ Atomica, the eyes and ears of SSX for spectators and competitors alike. Broadcasting live from my... The original SSX came out for the PlayStation 2 as a launch title in the year 2000, and I would argue it's probably the best launch title for that system. Sorry, Tekken Tag. While I really enjoyed the original game, it was SSX Streaky a year later that really made me a fan. I just love the crazy uber tricks it can perform, the unique track design, and all the kooky characters you get to snowboard as. Which is why when SSX 3 came out two years later, I was caught a little bit off guard. Not because the game was bad, but I noticed that a lot of the unique characteristics and the flair that Tricky had went away. No more crazy track design, no more over-the-top characters, especially all the celebrities that they spent all this money in Tricky to voice those characters are pretty much out of the window in the third game. And it just felt like a whole new different approach that at the time, I didn't really understand or play a whole lot. But that being said, as time went by, I always found myself picking that game up over and over again, and I realized that after much deliberation and as much as I really appreciate the unique design of SSX Tricky, SSX 3 is the peak, pun intended, of the SSX franchise for a myriad of reasons. But the biggest one is the fact that the entire game takes place on just one mountain, which may sound like little, but that one mountain has dozens of different events between races and trick challenges. There is a lot to do. That's all fine and good, but what really makes SSX 3 great is the fact that this, those challenges, you don't just select them from a menu. Your character has to literally snowboard down the mountain and get to the entrance of that set event. It's basically one big open world that takes place on this one mountain, which makes it incredibly unique and there's just a lot of things to collect and find a lot of secrets to explore each area of the game has those like little snowflakes you can collect that give you extra money and with that money you can buy cosmetics like snowboard decals or even add extra stats to your character which you will need because this game tends to get really hard towards the end one of my favorite things about SSX3 is that towards the end of the game, you can only go from the very top of the mountain on the third peak all the way down to the bottom of the very first peak. It's the final race event you get to do, and here's the kicker. The game gives you 30 minutes to do this, and while it sounds like a lot of time, as a matter of fact, it isn't, because it takes roughly 30 minutes to go all the way from the top to the bottom, and you have to do it in one straight run with no breaks, and it also has no loading whatsoever, so it's just a seamless experience. And honestly, just you, yourself, going against the mountain in one final challenge, it's one of the best victory lapse moments I've ever had in a video game, because I get to go through all those amazing locales and challenges I've played throughout the game. It's like, oh, I remember this racetrack, this was in the second peak. Oh, in the very final one, when I get to slide down the city, that, that I did that too. So it's incredibly awesome, and another reason why SSX 3 is such a phenomenal experience. The reason why I own SSX 3 on PlayStation 2 is because, well, the original was a system exclusive, and I'm just used to the control scheme, especially since every single trick button is on a trigger, so that way it's easier for me to perform uber tricks. The reason why I'm bringing this up, which makes it very interesting, is that, just like Crimson Skies, SSX was also going to be one of those games that would later become backwards compatible, on the Xbox Series X, and I would argue it's one of the marquee backwards compatible games on that system. If you have an Xbox One or a Series X, I highly recommend it because one of the things about SSX3 is that those games had a very long loading times regardless of what system you play it on. But if you play that game on Series X, the loading times are just instant. They're not even loading times. I don't think I've ever seen the loading times when I was recording footage using the Xbox Series version. SSX3 is the peak of the franchise, pun intended, and I highly recommend checking it out, especially if an Xbox Series console, because getting a copy nowadays is incredibly cheap, and I highly recommend. Enough talk. Time to ride. Stay tuned, right here, to Radio Big. 
Uh, let's get all the sucking jokes right now, because next up is... Kirby Air Ride. was a very interesting year for racing games on the GameCube, because we had both the hardcore F-Zero GX and the lighter and family-friendly Mario Kart Double Dash, both are phenomenal games, which is interesting because Kirby Ride is kind of like sandwiched right between them, and it probably came off at the least opportune time, because, oh boy, when this game came out, the reviews eviscerated it. I'm talking about GameSpot, IGN... All those different websites and TV shows like X-Play just did not like Kirby Air Ride all that much. And that was one of the main reasons why I didn't really buy a game until later on, because I saw those reviews, and at the time, you know, when a vast majority of critics say a game isn't good, there's no reason for me to spend my hard-earned cash on it. But even so, despite the fact that I wasn't a big fan of Kirby Air Ride since I played it all the way back in 2003, I've seen a lot of videos of other creators make essays about why Kirby Arrow is misunderstood, and I thought for this particular video to give this game one more chance, and as it turns out, this game is not as bad as people made it out to be, but I still don't love it. I still think there are some issues with this game, but it does have a lot of merits. I think my biggest gripe is just the whole idea that everything has to be done with the A button. And I like the idea of simplicity, but I think HAL Laboratories went a step too far in that direction. Because everything is done with the A button, between drifting and braking and using copy abilities, everything is done with the A, and because of that it just doesn't feel very, um, flowing. For a game that's pretty simple, it's surprisingly kind of tricky to control. Even though your character moves automatically, a lot of the time you just have to press the button at the right time to do your proper drifts and what have you. It takes a while to get the hang of Kirby Air Ride, and in general, what really makes the Air Ride mode pretty fun is the level design, the track design. Pretty much besides two, all of them are very unique. There are different paths you can take, different shortcuts, a lot of uh, unique secrets you can find. Um, they put a lot of effort into creating those race tracks. Uh, my favorite one is probably um, the Checkered Knights one, in which it starts in a like a seemingly grassy like sky area, but then you get to go on those rails and see like a city under the clouds, which is really cool, really beautiful. Another thing I really enjoyed is the checklist system, which I originally thought the first HAL game to have that was Super Smash Bros. Brawl. You know, when you complete a challenge and you do this like, you know, score list and one block is uh, broken, you have to complete the other task around that block. Kirby Air I did that first, which I didn't know. And each of the three modes have 100 different challenges to complete. Well, granted some of them repeat, it is a really cool idea that uh, you get to um, see what challenges they give you and try to accomplish them, like complete a lap in a specific track as fast as possible. There's a lot of interesting challenges that I really appreciated, but I, I, I do wish we still had some kind of a general like story mode or a campaign mode to really funnel those missions a little bit better. I think that most people will just play the tracks one time and drop the game and not even bother with the checklist system, which I, to to be fair, HAL did a much better job with that system in the future installments of um, Smash Brothers, but I think it's a really good prototype. Besides the main air ride mode, there's also the top ride mode, which is basically an over-the-top uh, race mode, kind of like RC Pro-Am, if you're familiar with that game, in which you have a choice between two different vehicles that control differently in terms of their steering, and you have to go through this area as quickly as possible, complete about, you know, five to seven laps to get first place. Lastly, and this is probably the biggest feature of Kirby Air Ride, is the City Trial Mode. You and three other players are supposed to collect stat icons throughout the map that will boost your strength, um, top speed, glide, defense, etc. in order to compete in an event that would come after the time has elapsed. And in order to do that, you have to go through this giant city and break crates with different pickups, finish different events, find secrets, there's a lot to do in City Trial Mode, and I think that's the reason why people really advocate and champion Kirby Air Ride, because that mode is the centerpiece of this game. City Trial as a mode is definitely the most unique. I just like the idea of exploring this big, giant city, and 
trying to go through every nook and cranny and try to collect as much stuff as I can while trying to attack my enemies and also steal their pickups, which is also very fun. And at the very end, I like having the events right now because you are you don't you as the player don't know what's gonna happen next. Maybe the event is gonna be a one lap race. Maybe it's gonna be a a target mode in which you have to hit the target with the highest number in order to get the most points. There are so many different unique events that it's just fun to go through City Air Ride and not knowing what to expect. Even though you can change it in the settings, but I like the randomness aspect of City Trial. That's what makes it a unique mode that no two City Trial modes are ever gonna be exactly the same. In fact, in Super Smash Bros. for the 3DS, they sort of brought that mode back in a way as Smash Run. Smash Run actually works in a very similar manner, is that you have a 2D area in which you collect power-ups in a similar fashion, and then there's an event at the very end, like a race or like a, a regular Smash battle. And I really enjoyed uh, Smash Run, it was probably the one reason why I think the 3DS version might be superior to the Wii U version. Uh, you know, at the very least, like, the one trump card it has, so to say. And if they ever, if there is gonna be ever, like, another Smash Brothers, I really want Smash Run to come back to some capacity, because it's all thanks to Kirby Era that we got that. Kirby Era might try to do a lot with a very simple premise, and even though not every experiment or risk they took worked, I have to commend them for a job well done overall. Before we end the video, let's have a rapid-fire round to cover some of the other notable releases in October 2003. SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom isn't just one of the best games in the franchise, but some call it one of the best tie-in platformers ever. In fact, it's so beloved it even got a remake. Castlevania Lament of Innocence is another attempt of making the Castlevania franchise 3D. And while the attempt is serviceable, it does have one of my favorite lines in gaming of all time. But I am beloved by the night. I'll kill you and the night! Mega Man X7 was a series' poor attempt of trying to do 3D gameplay. And while that was a big failure, at least it gave us one of the most unintentionally hilarious moments in gaming history. Flame Heinard. While Jack 2 strayed pretty far away from the colorful aesthetic of its predecessor, it still remains a beautiful and deep game that is still enjoyable after all this time, despite how difficult it can get. Grab by the Ghoulies was the first rare developed title published by Microsoft, and while their freshman release wasn't as well received as their prior games, it still has that rare, quirky charm that elevates it much more than its contemporaries. Gladius is a LucasArts game that doesn't involve Star Wars in any fashion whatsoever. In fact, it's a gladiatorial turn-based RPG that's very deep and has a lot of replay value even featuring celebrity voices in its cast like Michael Rosenbaum and Lina Cardellini. Last and certainly not least is Beautiful Joe, a phenomenal action game that holds up incredibly well, with fantastic cel shaded graphics, catchy soundtrack, a goofy and fun story, and a unique combat mechanic that allows you to both speed up and slow down time as the titular character. It spawned off a sequel, a couple of spin-offs, and even a decent anime. Whew, well that was a lot, but thank you very much for watching this installment of Games of Decades Past, and let me know in the comments if you like this multiple game format, since it's much different than what I used to do with a single game per month um, ordeal. And you know what? While October was stacked, November 2003 was probably the best month for that year because there are so many gems that there are multiple choices to pick and I'll probably have to do the same exact thing. So I hope to see you next month and until then, thank you very much for watching and take care.